So, hello everyone, um, and thank you for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about how to maintain um, high quality React Native code using just different tools and practices. So before we get started, I think it's really useful to have sort of a shared understanding of what quality code is. So when I started researching this, there was many different opinions. Um, what I've done is sort of boiled it down to sort of three core tenets of quality code that sort of make sense to me. So the first one is just to make the code readable, to make it easy on the eye, uh, not too bunched up, not too spaced out, um, but most importantly, just to have things consistent. So the goal is to have code that you can just look at and not have to sort of figure out why it looks so weird sort of thing and ultimately to have it, have it in such a way that it looks like any member of your team could have written it. So overall, this just makes the code easier to work with. It removes that barrier of what actually is this thing. So partnered with that is just to make it understandable as well. So uh, part of that is using common patterns and using those patterns consistently. So if you're using a library such as uh, Redux to understand the common patterns with that, and use those patterns consistently throughout your application. Um, this just makes working with the code much easier. There's a much lower, there's maybe a higher barrier to entry to get started, but once you understand the patterns of the, the project, you can just get going with it. And the last one is just to make everything, the project as a whole, maintainable. So part of this is just having the right tools set up and in place um, and having the project be well tested so that it's easy to check for regressions. And this just means you can move faster when you're making changes and worry a lot less about, am I breaking something or have to manually go back and test what's going on. So all of this stuff is important for any project and realistically, it's one of the key indicators for success. But for me, it's especially important um, because a lot of the time I'm working as a solo developer. So I'm a freelancer and that means a lot of the time, as I said, I'm working on my own. So I don't have that safety net of having a pull request open and someone else checking my code and making sure that the quality of it is high. It's all on me to make sure that, you know, that is the case. So just a little bit more about me. So I'm based down in Brighton. Um, so I've traveled up through the snow today. Um, I started off as a mobile developer, a native developer, um, in an agency, and I worked there for five years, first with Android, moving over to iOS and doing bits of back-end stuff as well. Um, but I went freelance about two years ago, and increasingly I've just been using React Native with client projects, just because it makes sense for the sort of projects that they want to do. Um, so I've been using React Native for what I thought was about a year and a half now, and doing many client projects through then, probably about I think, eight different apps through then and sort of evolving my processes as I've gone along. And throughout that, I've picked up just a series of tools along the way just to keep the quality of the code as high as I can. So I'm just going to go through those uh, sort of in different sections for what the tool does. Um, and as we're sort of short on time, we're going to go relatively quickly, um, but hopefully it gives you a good overview of the sort of things you should be looking for and a basic idea of how they work. So first thing is type checking. So this is something, this is basically the first thing that I missed as soon as I came over into JavaScript land. Um, so I'm used to Java and I'm used to Swift where the language is statically typed. And for me, that was a, just a massive um, safety net for me, just making sure the code that I was writing is correct. And when I came into JavaScript land, I sorely missed that. So after doing a little bit of research, um, I came across Flow. So the reason I picked Flow was because it's made by Facebook and it's used internally with React Native itself. So it works really well with React and React Native. And the way it works is that you annotate your JavaScript um, with uh, type annotations. Um, at runtime, there's no difference, it sort of gets, um, gets compiled away by the uh, Webpack, um, I think it's Webpack uh, Packer. Um, so it's just a tool for you to be able to use. And as I said, it's really easy to use with React Native. So best thing to do is just give an example of when this is probably gonna be useful. 
so. No? There we go. So, really simple function here. Take a quick look at it. No need to shout out or anything. Just take a quick look and see if you can find the error in this code. There we go. So someone shout out, shouted out. So yeah, as you said, the um, possible customer could be null. And therefore, when you try and access the name property on it, it's going to crash at runtime. So this code is completely valid. It will work. And actually, if you were writing this code properly, you wouldn't call it possible customer. You'd just call it customer, which would have masked made the error a little bit less obvious. So just to show that what this would look like when you start adding flow annotations to it. So the first thing you do is add in um, this little um, uh, comment at the top of the file. And this just tells the flow command line tool that you want to type check this file. So it's an opt-in thing on a per file basis. So what we then do is define the uh, customer type. So we say it's an object with two properties, name and email both of which are strings. And then here we can just annotate the possible customer parameter with a maybe customer. So we're explicitly saying this may or may not be a customer. So that's all fairly straightforward um, and quite easy to do once you get into the habit of doing it. And what this gives you when you run uh, this code through flow, it will explicitly give you this error. So it will say cannot get possible customer.name because the name property is missing on null or undefined. So it understands that this thing might be null and gives you the correct error message to say there's a problem here. Um, so just to finish this off, this is how you'd get around that, just checking is this, um, is this thing uh, truthy or not? Is it, is it there? If it is, access the name. If not, return something else. So this is quite a simple example, but Flow is quite clever in that it can do a lot of this um, inference for you. So if we were calling this function um, with sometimes a customer object, or what, look, what it thought looked like a customer object, and also um, sometimes passing in something that was potentially null, it would actually figure this out without us adding the annotation. So you can use this tool without adding all these annotations everywhere as well. So, oh yeah, so when you run it, it just comes up with no errors. So the other nice thing about it is it's possible to, inc uh, to adopt incrementally. You can, if you've got an existing application, you can, as I showed before, opt in on a per file basis and just start slowly. But the real value of it comes when you start adopting it across your application. So it's especially useful for things like your, uh, the structure of your Redux store and the properties that are coming into components. Once you do that, and you've also got the typing in the middle, you're able to really easily spot problems where you've changed your Redux store but to, to have a, something that's potentially null, but actually your component still assumes that it's going to be always there, and it avoids a lot of these little runtime errors. So as I said, we're going to have to move through this relatively quickly, so I'm not going to talk too much with each of these tools about how to actually get going with it. Um, but these are the websites that you can uh, go to. So the Flow website itself has lots of good examples about uh, how to use Flow and how the typing system works. And there's also a link there just to um, someone's uh, Medium article that, where someone said how to use it specifically with React Native. Um, so that's a really useful resource for getting going. OK, so we've got type checking, but that actually doesn't check everything to do with the uh, to do with our project. It, it tests that thing for potential runtime errors or potential errors like that. Um, but it doesn't check the sort of more uh, nuanced things in your application. So that's where something like linting comes in. So what this allows you to do is to check that your code matches a set of rules that you've set up. And these rules are things like um, not allowing uh, variables to be unused. So not creating a variable and then never using it or um, using something like uh, creating a component that's potentially not as optimized as it could be, that sort of thing. So that's where linting um, becomes useful, just for giving you best practice sort of small code fix up sort of things. So for that, my tool of choice is uh, ESLint. Um, so ESLint is a popular open source uh, JavaScript or ECMAScript if you want to get fancy, which is where the ES comes from, uh, linter. And the best way to show it is just to, to show what it does is just to show a really simple example again. 
So we've got here a, a React component with a style sheet, um, pretty straightforward. Um, but with the uh, ESLint uh, rules that I've got set up, there's actually four different warnings or four different errors inside this simple file. So you take a second and we'll go through them one by one. Let's see if you can spot any first. Okay, so the first one is right on the second line. So it's this import here. Actually, we're never using it, so there's no need for us to import it. So really simple thing, but it's gonna be able to flag that up. Um, the next one it's gonna do, and this, this is completely valid, but it's gonna flag up that actually there isn't a style in our style sheet called text. There isn't one there. Um, so that's just gonna be undefined, which is completely valid with React Native, but probably not what we meant to do. And equally, it can understand that this button style actually is never used. So it flags that up as a warning as well. So you can see with those two, you can potentially see there's an error where we've just misnamed something. And the last one is a bit more complicated in that it's, it's understood that this whole React component can actually just be optimized. So this whole thing is a component, but it doesn't have any state, um, it doesn't have any, uh, um, uh, state, any state property inside it. So actually what you can do is just use a standard JavaScript function. And that's a nice optimization and it'll flag this up for you. Um, even with sort of more complicated bits, um, it's able to flag this up. Um, and these are the sort of errors that don't necessarily matter a whole lot on their own, but when you've got quite a large project, it's sort of the death by a thousand cuts sort of thing. If you've got a project where there's a lot of unused variables or unused functions or just generally dead code that doesn't do anything, without some sort of warning to say, hey, this, is, might be, this isn't actually used or this could be optimized, it's really hard to spot, especially in a pull request of 20 odd files. So how many of these do you think would just get through a standard GitHub pull request? So again, just for completeness, this is just showing the code after the changes. So removing the alert, optimizing the um, component and just changing the name of that style. So again, they're only minor fixes, but added up over a, a whole project, it's surprising how many you have. We, I had one, uh, it was a native Android project, but we turned on the built-in linter um, about a month into the project thinking, oh, we'll just tidy these up. And we were surprised to see there was over 500 different warnings. So ESLint's a little bit complicated to get going with. There's, the, the way it's structured is that you've got the core of it, which is the command line tool, and the rest of it's made up of plugins and configurations and all sorts of stuff like that, um, which is a little bit hard to get your head around at first. But the best way to get going with it is to look at the uh, GitHub page for the uh, React Native ESLint plugin. And that actually has a good getting started guide for how to install ESLint itself and then um, the React Native plugin, which also gives you the React stuff and just the normal JavaScript stuff. So it'll give you quite a lot out of the box, but what you're able to then do is take those recommended rules and customize them to your needs. So if something's a bit too annoying, you can turn it off, or if actually it's not catching some errors, you can add those sort of rules in. So yeah, really useful tool, well worth looking into for your projects. Okay, so next one is this, this topic. So this causes sort of endless arguments between developers, so tabs versus spaces, semicolons or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all of those sort of things that, to be honest, it's just not worth arguing over. It's just, most of the time, it's a waste of time. So what I actually end up doing is using a tool called Prettier. So the way Prettier works is it takes your um, JavaScript code, it parses it in the same way that a compiler would, but then instead of running it, it rewrites your code in a standard way. So it's gonna be able to take in any valid JavaScript code and it will rewrite those files in a standard way or be able to give you a warning saying this isn't how we expected it to be. So it's a really nice tool because well, when I started using it, there were zero configuration options, which was lovely because there was no arguments. It was just a case of this is the way it is. I think now they've added a few more in just to appease people. I think there's eight now, I think. Things like, do we have semicolons or not? Do we use single quotes or not? But to be honest, just stick with the defaults. It's, it's really not worth arguing over. So what it also does, it can, as well as running in the command line, 
it can also run directly in your code editor. So essentially when you hit the, the save button, when you save your file, it will automatically reformat it in the way it wants. So that's really useful because you can write code like this that's really sloppy. Just hit the save button and it's formatted it in its way. And it's generally quite a nice way. It's, you know, there's some bits where you look at it and go, well, I wouldn't have done it quite like that. But you can start off with something really messy, even copying and pasting code from Stack Overflow. It happens, hit save, and you end up with it in a consistent style. So it's still useful if you're working on your own. So one way to use it is this, have it built into the editor itself. Another way is to have it running on the command line to give warnings or reformat things. So nice thing about Prettier, it's really easy to get going with. So if you're using the editor plugin, it's just install a normal editor plugin and it just works. Um, the command line side is just an NPM module. Um, yeah, it's really easy to get going with. But one quite nice thing as well is someone's written an ESLint plugin for it. So like I said, ESLint's a little bit complicated, but you can plug Prettier into that. So it will give you warnings when the code's not formatted correctly. And actually, you can configure ESLint to automatically fix problems that it comes out with. So yeah, it just saves any argument over code formatting, which is quite nice, even with myself. OK, so testing. Now, basically, everyone should be doing testing. There's sort of no reason why you shouldn't be a lot of the time. It's just really useful for just, especially when the project starts getting bigger, just proving that your code is still working. Um, once you make a change, just making sure that what you've got, you're, you've got a high level of confidence that that um, code is still working. And it just allows you to find issues before they become a problem. So recently on a project, um, so I'm a freelancer, so I worked on a project mid last year and the client went away, released the app, didn't want um, a retainer, which happens, and then came back to me uh, last week and said, we now need to update the app, make some changes. I was like, okay, great. React Native was then 10 versions behind, I think, which is kind of the standard if you wait half a year. So having the tests there and having a full test suite so being able to update React Native, run the test, see what's broken, and then go from there was just so useful. And it's only once you actually hit a problem where you've not got a test suite and it causes you endless pain that you actually, for every project after, just do it as a matter of course. And the really nice thing is uh, Redux and React code is so simple to test. So as I said, I come back from a, a native um, iOS and Android background, uh, working with Java and Swift, and testing those platforms is an absolute nightmare. It's just not nice at all, compared to the way you do it with um, React and Redux code. And the reason for that is that all of your code that you're gonna be writing, or most of your code in, uh, you're gonna be writing, is pretty much data in, data out. So a reducer, you pass in a state and an action, and it spits out another state that's really easy to unit test. Components are the same, you pass in properties and then out comes some JSX or some whatever that actually turns into and you compile it. So that means you can actually test each part of your application in isolation. So you can test your React components, you can test your, test your Redux reducers, your selectors if you're doing that sort of a pattern. And you know, on its own, that might not actually test the integration between any, everything, but if you've also got um, type checking set up correctly, like I said with Flow at the start, um, that's essentially testing that you've made, you've written the wiring code correctly. So if you change the uh, return type of a Redux selector or a you know a reducer sort of thing, the properties that are coming in are going to it's going to have the wrong value coming in, and that will flag that up really quickly. So the tool I use for this is Jest. And again, the reason I chose it is it's made by Facebook. It's used in React Native. So odds are it's going to work perfectly every time. Um, one nice thing about it, it has pretty much everything you need built in. It kind of goes against the normal um, sort of JavaScript ecosystem ethos of one tool doing one thing. It does the complete opposite. It's one tool that does everything to do with testing which in this case I actually quite like. So it's got mocking built in, it can do spies, it's got the matching library built in, 
Um, it's got the sort of general structure of the tests all there. And that's actually quite nice for this because you don't have to spend time configuring all these tools to work together when actually it should just be a tool that is helping you move faster. The other great things about it, it's got a really nice watch interface. So you can run Jest with dash dash watch and it can pretty intelligently figure out what files have changed and only run the tests that are related to the changes you've made. So you're not waiting on your entire test suite to run every time you hit save. And you can do fancy things like only watching certain files or certain test name regexes sort of thing. And again, built-in stuff, so built-in code coverage. So you don't have to figure out how to use tool called Istanbul, however that used to work. It's just built in, just run it with dash dash coverage. It gives you a coverage report, which is great. So it used to have a really bad reputation, um, probably about a year ago, because it basically turned on mocking by default on everything. So anything that your the file you were testing imported, it would just automatically mock it. And that was an absolute nightmare to figure out because you just come out with null, nulls that you weren't expecting sort of thing. But essentially they turned that off and it's now essentially what you'd get with Jest is what you'd get with uh, Mocha and Chai Jazz or Jasmine, one of the two. It's basically that all built in. Um, so just in case you've not seen it before, there's a, I've got a really quick example of what a typical test would look like. Um, so the describe blocks are just used to wrap groups of tests together. Um, so we just, in this case, we're describing, uh, sort of testing a UI reducer, so a Redux reducer. So the first bit is the it. So the it is the actual test itself. It's each test case is an it statement. And the way I like to write it, you don't have to do it this way, it's just it should return the initial state. So that's just the name of the test, what's going to come out where there's an error. And the tests themselves are really simple. So as I said, it's data in, data out. So we've got our reducer. We're passing in the un an undefined, which is what you get when you first start up the application. And we're just passing in a, a random action, just the first action that comes in. And we're just going to expect that the new state is going to match a snapshot. So this is a nice little trick that um, Jest has built in. So what will happen the very first time you run this code, assuming you're not on a CI server and it detects that sort of thing, when you're running it on your machine, it will see, OK, this new state, I don't have a snapshot for that yet. So let's create one. And it creates a, a, a file next to your test, your test module, which has whatever was in that new state variable. And it lets you know this is what has been stored. So it sort of says, this is, is this correct sort of thing. So that's all fine. Next time you run the test, it's going to see that you've already got a snapshot. And it's going to match the new state variable. Is it the same as the snapshot I've already got? If it is, great, the test passes. If not, it's going to it could basically give you a diff of what is actually different with this object. So that's actually quite a nice thing. And you commit that um, snapshot along with the rest of your code. It, it lives in your repository. Um, and the benefit you get with that is essentially you don't need to manually write out expect the new state to equal this object. Because in a lot of cases, you're just going to end up duplicating, you know, duplicating what you expect to happen in your tests quite a lot. And you kind of get the same thing by storing that in the snapshot file, but letting it manage it itself. And if it notices that there's a difference, and you think that's a legitimate difference after you've seen the diff, you can press, essentially, if you're in the watch interface, you press the U key for update, and it updates the snapshot. So you can really easily manage that as you go along. So it's a small thing, but when you've got lots of tests, it's actually quite useful. But it's important not to overuse it. You can go a bit crazy with the, match, the snapshots, and it just all goes a bit too much. Um, so just to finish this off, so there's another uh, test here just to make sure this one's a bit more manual uh, but still quite simple. So we've got a start state with the app loaded as false. We're basically testing that when we get the app loaded action, passing that in and the start state into the reducer, that we expect the new states app loaded to equal true. So pretty simple testing sort of stuff. So as I said, it works really well with React Native projects. Um, you're pretty much set up, ready to go. It's already got all of the configuration you need in most of the projects. Uh, best thing to do is just go to the official Jest um, website and just follow the instructions there to get going. Um, because yeah, it's not worth having projects that aren't tested, to be honest. OK, so all this is all, it's all well and good having all these tools, but 
running them out manually every time is gonna be a bit of a pain. It's gonna be the case that you forget to run them and when you do eventually run them, everything's broken and you have to spend a lot of time fixing it up as you go along. So the best thing to do is make sure all these errors and all these checks that are coming out are checked as early and as often as possible. The way I like to do this is to do it using Git hooks. So this basically means that when you commit or when you push, these tools are going to be run automatically. And if they fail, you won't be able to commit, you won't be able to push until you actually fix things up. Essentially, when you uh, run npm install or yarn install, um, it automatically sets up the Git hooks for you. And then you can just configure what those hooks do inside your package.json. So it's really easy to set up. And the real advantage is it's set up automatically for everyone who sets up the project. Because the first thing you do when you do a Git clone is do an npm install. And at that point, it's automatically setting up these hooks for you. So as I said, you can configure it to run um, with different Git events. So this is just a sort of um, summary of what uh, the package.json would look like. So the two changes we've made is we've added uh, two dependencies with Husky and a tool called Lint Staged. And as I said, when you run npm install, it will set up all the hooks for you. There's nothing else you need to do. And then the next bit is just adding some npm scripts. And these are just standard npm scripts that you can do with npm run, whatever they're called. But it's going to call these automatically when you do certain things with Git. So the two that I like to use are pre-commit and pre-push. So it's going to do some stuff before I commit things and some stuff before I actually push it out onto a remote server. So when you, do a, um, when you do a commit, so before it actually does the commit, it's going to run this tool called lint staged. So this is just configured down here. And it very simply just says that for every JavaScript file, it's going to run npm, npm run eslint with the fix um, uh, option. So it's going to check that eslint is correct. But it's also going to fix up any issues. And as I said, I've hooked this into Prettier. So at this point, it's going to be doing all the code formatting for us. So even if you're not using the editor prettier sort of things, at this point, without you even noticing, it's going to reformat your code and then run git add to add those changes in. So you can write, this means that the developers can write their code however they like. They can leave the semicolons off, put them on, use single quotes, double quotes, whatever. And it will format it at this point just before they commit which is really nice. The next bit it does is when you actually go to push, it's going to run yarn test or npm run test. And this I've just configured to run eslint again, just to make sure, um, but also run flow to do type checking and also run all of the unit tests for jest. So at that point, if any of those three things fail, then the push will just stop. It just won't push. And that's really useful because everything that then leaves the developer's machine is guaranteed to have those three things passing. Now, the reason I've chosen to do this pre-push and pre-commit is that ESLint is very quick to run. So you can very quickly just do git commit and the commit's done. You hardly notice that it's doing anything extra aside from a normal commit. Probably takes an extra second, which is absolutely fine. The actual testing, so running all the jest tests um, and flow the first time you run it takes a little while to set up. So that I don't want to run every time I do a commit because it's going to break my flow, essentially. So I only do that once you actually push. So just to give you an example, um, this is what happens when the, um, you try and commit something that actually isn't going to pass. So the, there's ESLint errors. So you start off with this as the git state, run commit. It starts off running the um, ESLint tool with fix, and it comes back with what is actually quite a lot of errors in this case. And at this point, the, the, uh, sorry, the commit just fails, and it won't commit. And you can see that from the state here. So it's sort of stopping you committing things that are incorrect. And the same thing will happen if the tests fail when you push. That does mean that um, you occasionally end up with um, tests that are failing when you've already done a commit and you have to then amend the commit that you've just done with a git commit dash dash amend. And you might see some people online saying never do that. But the reason you don't do that is once you've pushed and then you do an amend, you're changing the git tree. 
So because we're doing it in the pre-push, we're stopping you pushing, that's absolutely fine to do because it's never left your machine. So I find myself, if I've you know, committed something, not run the tests yet, and then go to push and there's one little error that I've missed out, you just occasionally have to do a little amend um, to that commit. So again, this is really easy to set up. Um, the Husky GitHub page has loads of information for this. Um, yeah, it's really simple to get going with. The package.json that I've shown you is literally what I use. So it's, yeah, it's really easy to get going with. So one last thing to touch on is the continuous integration side of things. So this essentially means having a remote server set up to run through all of the testing for every, um, for every change to your Git repository. So the ideal thing to do is to have it testing all of this stuff, but then for you to also be able to create um, and release from that environment. So people can just say, okay, where we are now, release this to the App Store. That's the absolute ideal. And there are tools that help you do this. But to be honest, I don't actually use this tool because as I said, I'm a lone developer. It's easier for me just to maintain my machine and do sort of set up everything on my machine. And I do have scripts that help me uh, push stuff out. So if anyone's used Fastlane, I use that quite heavily so I don't have to think about code signing ever again, which is so useful. Um, but here's a load of options. These are just some ones that I found when I was researching it. Um, as I said, I don't really have an opinion on which is better than others. Um, I've heard some good things about Bitrise um, working well, and App Center, which is actually a Microsoft product, strangely. Um, I've heard good things about that, being able to test everything, but also release from that environment directly into the Google Play Store and the um, uh, Apple App Store. So that's just a quick guide through, ooh, that's not good. Um, that's just a quick guide through um, some tools that you can use um, to maintain high quality code. So we talked about type checking with Flow and then linting that code using ESLint. And we talked a little bit about how you'd actually use a tool like Prettier just to remove all of those arguments about code formatting and just then running through uh, unit tests for Jest. And then actually tying all of those things together with um, Git hooks using uh, Husky and uh, Lint Staged. So those are just the tools that I picked up as I've gone along throughout um, the different React Native projects that I've worked on. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>